Miko Matsumura has an incredible history in uh, Silicon Valley, and we're thrilled to have him here. He is an investor at Gumi Cryptos and was a key investor in Agoric's early uh, round back in 2019. It's where he and I actually met we're as co-investors. Um, and Miko's history goes all the way back to Sun Microsystems and launching of Java and seeing the early explosion of communities and builders in a new ecosystem. So we couldn't think of anyone better to have here today to talk about opportunities for developers in this space. Yeah. Right. And and Vanessa, uh, please introduce yourself, too, because a lot of speakers here. Might oh, not know who my you goodness. Are. <laughs> so sorry. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Vanessa Pistrito. I am director of partner programs at Agoric, the operating company, and I work with partners building on the network, uh, technical partners for additional tools for developers like yourselves. How can there be a better experience for uh, developers to have access to the things that they might need to build a Web3 DAP, as well as technical service partners and a number of other things? Thank you so much. Great. Well, uh, sounds like it's uh, time for me to kick this off. So, th you know, thanks so much, Vanessa. Thank you, Jeff. And, uh, you know, it's really great to see, uh, you know, um, Mark uh, and the audience. Uh, shout out to you, uh, you know, some some old friends as well. So, uh, Jack, what I wanted to do is, yeah, you know, my history in open source developer platforms does go all the way back to the Java programming language. And I definitely got my start in Silicon Valley with that. So, you know, very much kind of OG on developer platforms, you know, and to me, I just wanted to just kick off this this morning here in California. I'm coming to you from Silicon Valley. And uh, yet I just wanted to really say that, like, from a venture investor perspective, like, you know, it's really in, in uh, our job is to kind of help people, you know, realize their their grand visions. Right. And to kind of look to the horizon to, uh, you know, re really see the potential of this emerging technology platform. So, you know, first of all, I just wanted to comment that, you know, I think Agoric was definitely one of those love at first sight uh, investments, you know, definitely just an incredible world class team. You know, all of the statements I'm about to make, you know, do apply to any, uh, you know, investment that that we get super excited about. Right. Because, you know, I think at Gumi Crypto's Capital, you know, we have had the good fortune to work with uh you know, really early seed stage investments in in projects like OpenSea and uh, you know, of course, Agoric, uh, things like Celsius Network, uh, One Inch, uh, you know, many, many kind of like unicorns and tridecacorns. And, you know, so for us, like we fall into this kind of classic sort of uh, unicorn hunter type of mindset, you know, when it comes to uh, venture investing. Right. So, you know, when we saw something like Agoric, uh, you know, we definitely got really, really tremendously excited you know i think that one of the things that's really fundamental to the way i reason about these things is that when you think about the emergence of trillion dollar franchises right like if you look at there there really was i think a moore's law cohort going back to the og era you know and now we have these kind of like border align or already exceeded three trillion dollar franchises like apple and microsoft that come from the uh, Moore's Law cohort, right? So that those are kind of really very platform centric, uh, you know, giants. I think the next wave actually is more of the Metcalf's Law cohort, which is sort of, uh, you know, when, when I got my start in Silicon Valley. So, you know, the Googles of the world, you know, these are these are the platforms that kind of are, are also in the trillion dollar category, you know, and, and if you kind of look at the your your notes, you know, the thing that's fascinating is it took Microsoft 44 years to get to the first trillion, you know, and it took uh, uh, Google exactly half that 22 years, you know, using the Metcalf's law uh, network value theorem. Right. And the thing that's kind of fascinating is, is it took Bitcoin about half of that time or about 12 years to get to the first trillion dollars, uh, you know, so. To me, I think that looking at this extremely longitudinally, you know, the thing that's really important about the Metcalf's Law cohort is that you have this dramatic relationship between platform and applications, right? And in essence, when you look at things like Amazon, you know, they they didn't launch with, uh, you know, just just the AWS, right? They they launched with uh, the bookstore, right? And so, you know, when you look at these horizontal platforms, you know, oftentimes they come with killer applications, right? That's really kind of the, 
theme or the way I reason about this type of stuff today, you know, and obviously from a platform perspective, you know, there's no better kind of uh, excitement that we have than, than looking at really beautifully well-formed infrastructure, you know, and I think one of the things that's so profoundly and deeply exciting about what's been delivered, you know, uh, it, it, with, with Zoe, you know, uh, ERTP, these kind of fundamental technologies in the Agoric stack is really that it's resting on, you know, SES, which is sort of this long time seminal work, uh, you know, of, of Mark Miller, who's here. And, you know, I, I think for me, the my passion for it is this idea of radical composability, you know, without compromising security. And this was kind of one of the deep infrastructures that actually power the philosophy of the Java platform, right? Which is the idea that you could have openness and security and that openness would actually create better security, right? So that, that was kind of something that people were challenging, which is at the, during its time, people were saying, oh, well, if you're open, you're inherently less secure. And, you know, I think that was something that we successfully challenged, you know? So when I look at, you know, getting to kind of the meat of what I wanted to say, you know, we are now kind of really excited about uh, investing in the killer applications on top of the Agoric platform. You know, so we're really looking for the next wave of developers who, who can take advantage of like run and build, who can take advantage of SES, you know, and who can build sort of the most powerful core components of this ecosystem, right? Because, you know, we're talking about like money Legos taken to the, you know, nth degree, right? So when you, when you think about the idea of composability, like composability is sort of the compounding interest law of the universe within developer land, right? So, you know, compounding interest is financially powerful, but composability is powerful from the perspective of development, right? So, we, you know, we couldn't be more excited about sort of fundamental composability with, with no compromise on security, right? So, you know, for us, what it means is it means that there's a potential for these very core building blocks in this ecosystem to to become sort of the next giants right so the potential for the giants you know we we're out actively looking for things like a like a stripe of uh agoric or we're looking actively looking for uh you know things things like a square we're looking for like a custodial wallet we're looking for uh you know things like shopify you know we're definitely looking for you know lots of kind of opportunities to build uh, you know, real kind of core Web3 functionality, you know, on top of this ecosystem, you know, because we we passionately and deeply believe that this is, you know, uh, the future, uh, probably top three uh, blockchain by total value. You know, we, we definitely think that, uh, you know, and it isn't to do with the language semantics per se, you know, despite the fact that JavaScript is arguably one of the most popular programming languages on the planet. You know, it, it, it isn't about language semantics, you know, obviously there's a gigantic advantage of recruiting developers. You know, one of the things we've long talked about uh, in the Agoric community is about enterprise software development, you know, and actually enterprise smart contract development. So, you know, we do think that there is a lot to do there, you know, and developing smart contract programmability on top of things like a visa network or on top of things that, you know, across payment networks and across enterprises kind of eliminates a lot of incredible, you know, stupidity within the enterprise, all of these crazy kind of like API economy things that you can do, you know, have this web services gateway where, you know, you get billed on a net 30 for the number of, you know, API calls you made, right? Which is, you know, how stupid is that? Like that, that makes no sense, right? Like ultimately you want autonomous, like uh, scripts to basically be sort of managing their own resources dynamically, you know, and paying in band, right? So, you know, if you make a method call, you should just pay for it right then and there, you know, instead of like waiting for accounts receivable to kind of like, you know, mess around with, with payments, right? So, you know, we think that, that, Obviously, JavaScript is meaningful, but the biggest, deepest insight here is open and secure composability, right? So, you know, because of this opportunity, we think that there's an opportunity for, you know, what, what we think of as a Cambrian explosion of biodiversity on top of the Agoric platform, you know, so we're, we're very bullish. So our fund is, uh, you know, actively 
looking for agoric centric developers you know we're actively engaging them you know obviously we're talking very closely with vanessa about kind of core developer needs and uh you know we're looking for you know really ambitious uh developers who want to play a big role in developing this whole ecosystem you know we do think that this will be one of the most valuable uh blockchain ecosystems in the world uh, you know and we, and we think that it it really is purely on the strength of this kind of secure composability you know the, the thing that i think you have to liken this to is in in biological evolution there's something called the cambrian radiation or cambrian explosion which is this mass production of biodiversity on earth including kind of, of some forms that almost appear insane biologically right so when you go back to the burgess shale and you study kind of the fossil record you're going to see an incredible plethora of novel forms of organisms during this incredibly fertile period right but i think this is really subsequent to the development of multicellular life right so the idea that you know different cells perform different functions and they work together in the form of an organism it turns out that that invention of multicellularity is actually pretty important you know and when you think about the idea of multicellular organisms you then have incredible division of labor you have incredible rapidity of the expansion of possible forms and possible niches you know and possible ways to sort of transport solar energy you know throughout the biosphere right so you know in a sense like that's the next phase we're sort of metaphorically uh, describing the next phase of the agoric platform, right, which is this Cambrian radiation, but really hyper amplified by radical composability, right? So, you know, we think that the speed at which this network achieves kind of full economic capacity, you know, will actually be dramatically faster than, you know, previous ecosystems simply through this property of composability, right? So in a sense, like, you know, what do we look for? You know, obviously the first thing we look for is like team, you know, so in essence, like teams are the most important thing in the world. And it's kind of what got us the most pumped up about uh, Agoric itself as an investment, right? Because when you look at the history of the players and the team, you know, it, they're, they're folks who have been studying smart contracts, you know, a lot longer than there's ever been blockchains, right? So it, it definitely is super OGs, you know, really deeply understand the problems of smart contracts and you know, are delivering very, very practical technical solutions for these problems, right? So I think that foundation is super exciting, you know, and so we look for, you know, and you don't have to be like necessarily a super OG in order to kind of garner investment, you know, obviously to us, like we're looking for these unique combinations of backgrounds, you know, in our fund called Gumi, you know, we call these individuals uh, Gumi corns, you know, and it's it's more of a state of being rather than uh, a number right so you know you can be a gumi corn you know even if you've created zero billion dollar startups you know it's really more of a of a character statement it's sort of who who is this person you know and i think that we look for these properties of like what we call a di diamond head but like really good ears you know so in a sense you know it's a person who can can have who's very very kind of hard-headed but at the same time, really good at, at listening. Uh, I, I think Vanessa came off mute, so I'm, I'm wondering if... Uh, yeah, yeah, I was I was going to... You know, this is such a vast opportunity. Sometimes I feel like when we talk about these opportunities at large, people might think, well, that's not for me. But there's so much work to be done here. There is work for them here. There's so many opportunities here. So on top of the Gumi corns, there's also services. There's early infrastructure that needs to happen. Do you want to talk about a bit of those or what you foresee as essential in the first two years or first year? Yeah, uh, one, one tremendously huge opportunity that we see is we see an opportunity for a custodial wallet service, right? And that's one of the things that I think the platform is really kind of almost morally incapable of providing, right? Because in a sense, you know, there has to be an arm's length between sort of platform and, you know, essential services providers, right? So I think that the idea of a custodial wallet service then naturally enables an adjacency of something where you have APIs that are way more kind of Stripe-like. So I think there's a combination of like a custodial wallet service with like a Stripe. And I think the other thing that comes with that, so this becomes, I think, a potential Titan because once you have kind of a custodial wallet service, you actually have the opportunity to provide 
sort of yield and banking services, you know, to the the holders inside of the wallet if it's custodial, right? So so to me, like, you know, what we look for are kind of nodal points where you can really aggregate uh, lots of, um, you know, financial value, right? That you can accrue value and recognize that value. So, you know, <clears throat> we do think there's a huge opportunity there. Um, you know, and, and I think the thing that's really exciting is, of course, that like, you know, as with the expansion of, you know, any sort of ecosystem, you know, obviously there are these incredibly uh, big tent poles, you know, these really big, big giants that emerge, right? But, you know, underneath the, you know, within the big tent, there's, you know, thousands of developer opportunities, you know, that, that both fit people's experiences and also kind of fit their enthusiasms, you know, like, yeah, obviously, you know, we see opportunities across the boards and, you know, things like, uh, you know, even in the gaming space, right, we're seeing, you know, really novel uh, performance characteristics, computational characteristics, platform characteristics that could make Agoric into a really wonderful platform for things like play to earn gaming, you know, this kind of emerging uh, area. Obviously, you know, one of the things that that is super exciting and, and transparently clear is that, you know, we need borrowing and lending facilities, right? So, you know, just basic DeFi services and financial services, you know, we, we need all of them, right? So that's a that's a really easy one, you know, and I think one of the things that makes Agoric extra exciting for DeFi is just the, the ability for composability. I think, you know, I think you're going to have an order of magnitude improvement in composability, you know, so I think the speed of the DeFi ecosystem, the dynamism, the liquidity, like I think all of these factors are going to really be, um, you know, amplified within Agoric DeFi, you know, so I think obviously Agoric DeFi, you know, we do see, you know, kind of Agoric base layer services like custodial wallet and kind of Stripe. We do see like a, a role for a yield aggregator provider, you know, so the, you know, they, there's just a, and obviously like the in the gaming space, that's a that's a wonderful uh, opportunity. So the, these are all things that we're super excited to see, you know, and, and um, you know, we're, we're just happy to to be in the community talking to developers who, who are, you know, dreaming up the future. That's wonderful. And on the, the gaming note, Gumi Cryptos uh, has a connection in the gaming industry. Would you want to uh, share any of that with some sort of overlapping opportunity for the audience today? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, Gumi has a history of being involved in the gaming industry. Uh, you know, Gumi Inc. is a basically a publicly traded game company in Japan. So, you know, my partner, who's based in Tokyo, actually is an OG in the gaming space. Uh, ever since Gumi went public, it's launched three game VC funds. So, you know, we know a lot about investing as a VC in the gaming sector, as well as gaming adjacencies, uh, including things like streaming video. The sort of immediate nascent kind of investment that spawned the first Gumi Cryptos Capital Fund was actually Theta Networks, which is sort of a dodecacorn in the sort of game adjacency of streaming video. It's a bit like Twitch for crypto, you know, with a decentralized CDN. So, you know, we think we think that's those are all exciting segments, you know. But in addition, uh, Gumi has launched sort of a pure play uh virtual reality investment fund that invested in things like Beat Saber, you know, and we're now we're now working on our uh, second pure play crypto blockchain fund, you know, and that's that's the one through which we would be investing in all of the Agoric ecosystem uh, startups and companies. Right. So for us, uh, you know, that that includes sort of the gaming angle, you know, but obviously we've done quite a lot in developer infrastructure platforms. Uh, we've done quite a lot in DeFi, we've done quite a lot in CeFi, and we've also done quite a lot in NFT and gaming, right? So, you know, I think for, for us, we do have a game-focused partner, but, you know, we also kind of uh, invest across the boards uh, in terms of blockchain. Wonderful. So if we have uh, any JavaScript developers in finance that are looking for a DeFi project to join or one to launch, um, where do you think they should uh, get comfortable getting in front of some of these companies? Are there some in your portfolio outside of Agoric or would you um, recommend that they 
join certain channels or groups because some of these people I think are very new and may not have even gone into the telegram rabbit holes that we live in every day. I'm curious to see what you recommend. Uh, you know, I mean, the thing that I think is is really amazing about what you know this this community is is that you know to me like the speed at which people can become comfortable in this so-called web3 arena it's it's pretty fast right and i think one of the things that's exciting to me is that when you think about web3 it's almost there's almost a 90% web2 quality to it you know it's it's funny for me to to characterize it that way but you know there's so much kind of a you know classic web2 development right so i'm i'm encouraging for example you know uh, friends of mine who who do kind of um, things like React Native, you know, so really classical sort of Web two JavaScript front end development to you know really just start hitting the, you know, hitting the Agoric website, coming to events like this, you know, meeting meeting hooking up with uh, you know Vanessa who's like running this prolific kind of developer resource, you know. So I think those are all like great places to kind of get your head dipped into this you know i think one of the really exciting things about sort of javascript is the history of kind of front-end development with these sort of prolific frameworks like angular and react you know that have really been seminal to developing the entire front end of of you know web 2. so you know it feels to me like organically we can connect this sort of uh you know a lot of these sort of front-end applications to things like payment rails or to, you know, DeFi financial services or to some of these, uh, you know, really core capabilities. For me, like, uh, you know, we we look, obviously, you know, we're, we're teams first people, you know, we love being early. So, you know, we're definitely early stage investors. So, you know, even if you just kind of have an inkling or an idea that you want to maybe do something, you know, one of the things that we look for with respect to kind of this diamond head and these kind of like, good listener skills, right, is that, you know, we want to kind of engage pretty early. So even if you're like, hey, I've got this inkling of an idea, for, for me, that's a perfect time to speak with myself. I, I have open DMs on Twitter, you know, so I'm definitely happy to kind of start at the beginning, you know, because the longer, the scarcity isn't really uh, dollars, you know, from an investment perspective, right? The scarcity is really the time spent with entrepreneurs, you know, and for me as my you know my my temperament is I, i'm sort of a, a non-judgmental intuitive perceiving temperament and so you know to me like in order for me to kind of decide i want to work with someone on a more serious professional basis like it actually takes me some time right so you know the kind of things that i think are are you know less exciting for me are you know things things where you just show up and you're like you know term sheets friday you know in or out we just met type of deals you know i you know if we just met then like <laughs> i'm a little less inclined to maybe like you know make a big bet on on you you know it's it's much better if i've gotten to know you over time and that's just me there's there's definitely people who are faster than me at judging people uh you know for for better or for worse um miko it's uh, jeff i so from it, for myself actually i was selfless i, I should say i'm <laughs> I'm just going to ask. So, so if people have more than an idea of they're building their team and they're looking for the first round of investment, it sounds like it's it might be the right time to approach you. Uh, is a tweet the best approach, or like what do you, what is your preferred method of engagement for people who are listening, be listening to the playback, as well as you know people who I know who are looking for that person to believe in what could be a, a you know what they believe to be a Web three unicorn. Yeah, absolutely. So for me, uh, you know, uh, Twitter DM is great. Uh, you know, I think you can you can even shout directly onto the feed. You can you know send me a tweet. You know, I'm pretty active on on Twitter. That's probably the easiest. You know, and especially for someone who's listening today on uh, you know Twitter Spaces, right? So it's probably easiest just to connect through Twitter. Uh, you know, I, I I'm active on. Uh, LinkedIn, you know, uh, and, and, you know, I think with a little, if, if you go to my website, you know, Miko.com, there's also a little form you can fill out to say hi. So, you know, it, there's, it's definitely not super hard to figure out. It's not a big IQ test to figure out how to get to me. But, uh, you know, I, I'm definitely uh, all ears when it comes to, you know, anything agoric. And, you know, we're, we're definitely, you know, excited to be actively deploying, you know, into the agoric ecosystem. You know, we're, we're, kind of uh 
you know, uh, diehard believers. So, you know, because of that, we, uh, you know, we think that the early movers in this space, you know, especially if they have the right kind of uh, experience or mindset, right, they'll, they'll be tremendously successful, right? They may, they may pivot a little bit as, you know, other entrants come in, you know, with their offerings and things. But like, you know, I think if you're diligent and you ship software, you know, relatively quickly that people want to use, you know, if you have that kind of ability, then you'll, you'll definitely do well in here. Wonderful. I was just curious about how casual, but it sounds like a, I've, I've, uh, I, I think your, your inbox may get filled with uh, people who are listening, let alone some. Right. Like it. So love it. And uh, I guess the other follow up is, well, it's one thing for you to look, but how do you keep your, how, what, what could someone do to keep positive attention from you in their, in their journey? Yeah, uh, that's a great question. I think as an early stage investor, one of the things that's so interesting is, is that like, you know, it, there's an element of kind of engagement that kind of happens, right? So for in my style or methodology, like, it's kind of a, almost like a pickup ball kind of mentality, right? So, you know, I'm gonna like throw you a ball, like, you know, if you throw it back, right? So what, what do I mean by this, right? Which is, I'm generally favorable towards trying to be helpful, you know, and part of my efforts to try to be helpful are really just to engage a person, you know. So in a sense, like one of the things I love to work on is like, you know, pitches, right? So in a sense, like if someone's pitching me on something, you know, I'm pretty game to kind of work on the pitch with them, you know, and if, you know, and if they turn around and take the, you know, an improved pitch and they use it to raise money from someone else, like, yeah, that's great. Like, you know, I, they probably didn't enjoy the experience. They might've gotten that, you know, tips on how to improve for me. And, you know, if they want to turn around and work with others, that's also fine. Right. So I, I don't, I think that the time period before you write a check is actually a magic opportunity to be helpful to another person just out of your own kind of like ethos, you know? So in a sense, like, you know, if you're helping people before you have any economic interest, then, you know, it's more of a statement of character and it's more of a statement of kind of like, you know, who you are, right? So in a sense, like, you know, to me, like, I like to help people early on. Um, I think the way that you kind of engage, you know, is, is you know, I just kind of like, you know, do your best to bounce the ball back. You know, I think one of the things that's amazing is, is that like, <clears throat> you know, it, it, a lot of it is kind of mindset and attitudinal, right? So, you know, obviously, you know, <clears throat> there are a lot of demands on my time, you know, uh, I, I definitely, uh, you know, I'm trying as hard as I can not to be like a, a douchey VC, you know, uh, <clears throat> I, you know, there is that huge kerfuffle online about Calendly links, you know, so I, I am guilty of charts <laughs> where I, I have a Calendly and I definitely like <clears throat> people to schedule my time on it, you know, so it's, there's definitely kind of a talk to the hand thing that happens, you know, so it's, yeah. it's kind of important not to take stuff like that personally, you know, cause like, you know, my, it's, it's just like, you know, and I, I don't, I try not to take that kind of stuff personally either. Right. In the sense of like, I'm just a guy standing next to a pile of money. Like, you know, most startups want money. So like, you know, I don't, you know, I don't, I don't, I try not to get a big head off about stuff like that. You know, it's, it's really just, you know, people lining up to get money, which is great, you know, and that's, that's part of the job. So, so for me, like, you know, I'm definitely interested, you know, and I think the thing that happens because of this kind of like time constraint, right, is that I think people are maybe a little pushy, you know, uh, I think, you know, you don't want to take it beyond the realm of like rationality, but, you know, right. but I think if people are kind of a little pushy, it's actually not that bad, right? It's like, oh, that entrepreneur is a little pushy, right? <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> you know, like that, that's, you know, that's a good quality, right? Because the world, you know, the world isn't necessarily going to beat a path to your door. You know, like you should definitely, you know, try to get in people's face just a bit, you know, and obviously if they tell you to go away, like that's probably, they're probably not playing a game, you know, but, but I would say that, you know, it, it, it's a, yeah, there's a little static friction when it comes to building relationships. And, you know, that's, that's something that uh, I think is really essential in the early part of things, you know. But I think if somebody shows a constructive, positive attitude and they want to work together, you know, that's just great. That's, you know, because in a way, like, that's the only way you really get to know entrepreneurs, right, is by working with them. Absolutely. I appreciate that. And 
we're we're at the close of, the, of your time spot. I would I would continue because I have lots of questions. But I would uh, say thank you on behalf of uh, all of us here at Blue Lava. Um, thank you for sharing your time. And uh, if I've had just one quick follow up is what is a pro as someone who's interested in, in a startup, um, you know, what is a typical due diligence time for you from the time you meet someone to the time if you decide to invest and the time is ready? Is it you know weeks? Is it months? Just so I understand, and then I want to definitely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're 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 absolutely conviction gated, but we're also active participants in the process. So what I mean by active participants is is that people have brought us things, and I've said that isn't really that great, but I'm happy to help you. You know, and so we've actually kind of worked together with people over, you know, in some cases the period of months to kind of refine how they're pitching, what they're doing and their ideas and strategy, you know, and we've, you know, that's culminated in some cases with an investment, you know, I would say that like, <clears throat> you know, ideally, it, you know, it would take like a couple months to go through our process. You know, we, we, since we're conviction gated, like it's happened, you know, lately it kind of can happen within the span of a week, but, you know, obviously we prefer, uh, we prefer to actually get to know people before we go into business with them. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much, Miko. I, I appreciate the context. And uh, on behalf of everyone, thank you for being here. Thanks for sharing your enthusiasm. And uh, I will follow up. I'm sure others will, too. Yeah, please do. I'm, I'm very excited to talk to you all. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, our next speaker has a presentation. I just retweeted.